Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's event, Making the Case for Midlands Rail Hub. It's kindly supported by Midlands Connect. Uh, the purpose of the event is to explore why delivering the Midlands Rail Hub is key to the region's uh, future. Uh, and we've got a great panel to make the case and explore the issues uh, around the hub and what we need to do in order to, to move it forward. I'll introduce them uh, in, in a second. And as a quick reminder, the event is being recorded and will be available on our website after the event. So let me introduce our, our panel and we'll get into the details. So our panelists are Sarah Spink, who's Strategic Partners Manager at Midlands Connect. We've got Toby Ratcliffe, who's Str Strategy Lead for Rail Policy at West Midlands Rail Executive and Transport for West Midlands. And Raj Kandela, who's Head of P Policy and Strategic Relationships at the Greater Birmingham Chamber of Commerce. So there are three panelists. In the usual way, they'll take a few moments just to set out their thinking on the Rail Hub, and then we'll move into discussion and questions from you. So as you're listening to our panelists, uh, think about the questions that you want to pose, and you do that via the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'll get to that in due course. So. Without further ado, Sarah, why didn't you, you kick us off with, give us a, the, the scope and nature of what actually the Midlands Rail Hub is. Sarah, over to you. Uh, thank you. It's all right. I was just trying to work out whether I have to unmute myself or whether someone else is going to do it. Um, the Midlands Rail Hub is a game changer, and it's what we need to really progress here in the Midlands. It's, and it's not just for Birmingham, it's for the wider region. Now, why is this? I'll give you a bit of background on this. So uh, Midlands Connect is the subnational transport body for the region, and we cover a patch that goes from the uh, Welsh border all the way across to the Lincolnshire coast. So I spend quite a lot of my time sitting on trains and getting around and seeing what it is the region needs. And what we need is that more connectivity. Um, we don't build trains because we you know, like to, we don't like pouring concrete. We build trains, we build roads, we invest in infrastructure because we need that connectivity. That transport's an enabler to help, not just us as people, but to help the region grow. It helps us access education, jobs, leisure, whatever it is that we want to do. So as a subnational transport body, we have two roles. Uh, number one is to develop a strategic transport plan, which uh, was updated last April, and that's uh, on the website. Um, but the other is then to research and recommend and sort of prioritize the investment needed and the projects needed. And this is our number one. This is what we need. Uh, and what it actually is, is a series of measures to increase capacity in Birmingham. But as I said, it's not just about Birmingham. These measures, which in railway engineering terms are actually quite small, um, will impact Herefordshire, Leicestershire, Lincolnshire, Worcestershire, you know, all across the region. Um, and essentially, it's made up of two cords uh, coming out of Moore Street, one which will enable better access to the southwest, one over to the East Midlands. But what these things also do is provi provide resilience in our city centre. It provides access into different stations. And more and more, it provides capacity because Birmingham is full. So however much we want to improve uh, the network, whether locally, regionally or nationally, we've got to sort out this bottleneck. And this is what this does. It will increase frequency of services to Leicester. We can have additional trains to Hereford. Uh, it will bring back the cross city south to the sort of six trains an hour. All these sort of things will come out of this piece of infrastructure. Um, it was talked about in the Tory party manifesto in 2019. It's part of the integrated rail plan. Um, we just need to make it happen. And it's, I shouldn't, I should say, it's not just us shouting about it. You know, we've got uh, West Midlands Rail Exec, Tobe, we've got businesses, we've got MPs, we've got Network Rail. Network Rail have been working incredibly hard putting this business case together so that we actually submitted what's called the outline business case uh, to government in December. Uh, of last year and now we're just waiting on sort of the, well we're not waiting we're getting on with it but we are waiting for the official sort of next stage of this is where we go from here and this is what needs to be done brilliant so um so you said it, it went in in september uh so uh, and you're waiting what is there a sense as to you have some sense as to what when the next phase 
would be, and, and let, let's assume that it, it moves yeah. in the way that you would ideally want it to, when would things, you know, when would things on the ground begin to happen? And then, you know, think, is it a phase program? You know, do things happen over a period of time or is it kind of a big, you know, a, a, a big dump of stuff that all happens at the same time? Just give us a sense of time scales and, and where we are in the pr process. This can happen fast. In railway terms, this could be delivered in a phased program, but between 2025 and 2030. So uh, one of the first things we do is reinstate platform four at Snow Hill, get some extra capacity in that way. We then look at work on these cords. There's engineering works at Kings Norton, at Barn Green, at Water Orton, that would all add to this capacity that needs to go in place. But this isn't new. This was first thought about in the 90s, and then it was brought back with Network Rail in, I think, about 2014, as part of their capacity study. Midlands Connect picked it up as our sort of flagship rail um, project. We submitted the strategic outline business case about three years ago. We were then awarded money with Network Rail to deliver the outline business case. We've now got to, if you like, the next gate point, and that's the to take us to a full business case. And so we're waiting on this sort of what's called a decision to design. But that doesn't mean we've, we're just sitting on our laurels. We're getting on with it as much as we can, but we need that official decision to just uh, decision to design design. Let me get that right um, through what's called the Arnet process in order to take that forward. But yes, this could all be in place uh, before 2030. And we'll talk a little bit more. In fact, we'll, you know, we'll off, we'll tend to focus as much on what it does for the, you know, for the Midlands region broadly defined. As you've said, you know, it's quite broad. But but you're also making the point that that, that you know the location, that the hub plays a role in the national network as well as in the 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 more regional network. Is that which is why we need to think about it in both of those kinds of ways? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's triplicate. It's local, it's regional, right. and it's national. It makes the region ready for HS2. We've got HS2 coming. We've got to make sure we make the most of it so that it benefits the whole of the region, not just those areas that have got stations. Right. I think we've I think we've decided, I think we've decided, I think we've determined there are 30 different areas or 30 different uh, areas with stations that would benefit from this investment. Um, and that's obviously way beyond Birmingham itself. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, we'll we'll come back and pick up some of those issues. I think in in the the conversations. Thank you very much for that kind of opening uh, scene setter. Toby, just take that on a little bit. Obviously, you're thinking about it from the West Midlands area. Just begin now to fill in a little bit of the detail about how how it sits and fits into the into the West Midlands perspective. You just unmute. There we go. Yep, got it. No, thank you. Yeah, I'm um, just to say, I mean, I represent West Midlands Rail Executive and Transport for West Midlands on this. So not just the combined authority area, but going right out into the shires down towards Herefordshire, um, Worcestershire, across to Staffordshire. Um, and, you know, as Sarah says, this isn't necessarily a new project. You know, we've been talking, I've been here 20 years in the West Midlands. It certainly predates my time here. We did some early work on this in the 2000s. And, and fundamentally, you know, it's, it's about a couple of things. It's about capacity for the transport network as a whole. How do we continue to get more people into, into the centre of Birmingham in a sustainable manner without, without clogging up the roads? And we had had some success. You know, if you go back to 2000, only around 17% of, of people commuting into Birmingham were going by rail. Pre-COVID, that had gone up to nearly 40% and rail had overtaken car for the first time in something like 40 years in terms of the preferred means of accessing it. And that all supports, you know, not just, you know, clean air in the cities, but the wider sustainable and green agenda in terms of that creating that modal shift. But we need that capacity to enable that to happen and, and to support our, the economic growth that we're seeing in Birmingham city centre, which is partly driven by things like HS2 and our connectivity and our unique place, as Dennis, Denise Wetton said yesterday from a network rail perspective, at the heart of the UK rail network, just not the regional network as well. And, and, and the issue is this is an issue for tomorrow. You know, Birmingham New Street is already effectively at capacity. You know, we've only been able to plan in our new services to the new three Camp Hill stations, at Mosley Village, Kings Heath and Pineapple Road. You know, we've only been able to do that by actually reducing or, 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 or holding back the number of services on other routes at the West Midlands. So we're already into the position where if we want to continue to expand the network with some you know, very uncomfortable trade-offs. 
And in terms of you know, breaking that capacity deadlock, Midlands Rail Hub is, is the only cost effective show in town here. You know, we've, we're lucky. We've got space at Moore Street where we can expand, which we don't have at New Street. And New Street, it's not the platforms that are the issue necessarily, it's the tunnels yeah. at either end of the station to create the constraints. But Moore Street, we've got space for new platforms, we've got space for new flats coming in, and we can critically build these two new cords at Bordsley to connect with the Camp Hill line that gives us access both to the southwest and across to Worcestershire and Herefordshire and also out towards the East Midlands. So it's I mean, effectively at the moment, it's a Birmingham city centre bypass and we're linking more street into that bypass to enable us to deal with that with, with that issue. And, and, and it, it ticks so many boxes, you know, from the national level, it improves connectivity to HS2 from the southwest, the South Wales, Herefordshire and Worcestershire. From the regional level, it's all about you know, improving those key pan-regional links between the core cities, between Birmingham and Leicester, between Birmingham and, and, and Cheltenham and Gloucester and Hereford, and you know, all of these places where actually you know, there is real demand for, for better and, and more frequent and, and more capacity on those rail services going forward. And on the local level, from our point of view, you know, it does more than that. If we can unlock the capacity in the heart of central Birmingham, we can start to look at the network differently and how we use the network differently. And um, it's it's probably telling that you know Midlands Rail Hub, it absolutely fundamentally underpins not just Midlands Connect strategy in the Midlands Engine Rail program, uh, but also Network Rail's recently published strategic advice for the West Midlands looking ahead 30 years or more, which if, if anyone hasn't seen it, I'd urge them to go and look at the Network Rail website and read that. It's a really good piece of work. And it underpins our strategy, our West Midlands Rail investment strategy, and also combined authority mayor's own aspirations for growing the, the rail and metro network going forwards. And without Midlands Rail Hub, you know, there is a substantial chunk of all of the rest of those enhancements that we just won't be able to do because we still haven't solved central Birmingham at the heart of the network. So I shall leave it there. Yeah, there no, the well, again, super helpful in both, in both beginning to broaden out that at, at its heart, obviously it's a transport scheme, but the implications, the benefits, the consequences extend well beyond just people being able to have a better transport experience, however defined as passengers has actually got uh, environmental issues it's got social issues it's got economic issues uh, or benefits that we should you know we can think about uh, you know I'd be interested when we get into a conversation about you know, the extent to which those strengthen the argument and the degree to which they're bought into by you know the transport side of the discussion which you know is always a kind of there's an interesting sort of dynamic going on there but let's let's um let's get our initial res uh, reflections from Raj obviously you, Raj you're coming at it from a business perspective we've touched yeah. a little bit on the economy and the business environment just say a little bit about how you think about the the rail hub and why it's very important to you know to you and to your members yeah completely and thank you andrew and uh, hi everyone um so i've been with the chamber for Ch birmingham chamber for about six years now when i first joined we did a big piece of work on the impact of congestion on the local business community and i think around two thirds of businesses said they were impacted by congestion in a negative fashion it was having a direct impact on productivity and economic output. And one of the key things they wanted to see was greater investment in the local transport networks to alleviate some of these issues. So programs like the Midlands Rail Hub are really important for our region for a number of different reasons. I mean, firstly, it's thinking about the rail connectivity and what that can bring from an economic point of view. And really from for our businesses, as we emerge from uh, the pandemic, and obviously the economic challenges they're facing right now, Having those connections to different parts of the country will make such a big difference. I think from a, looking at the uh, benefits it will bring, so thinking about access to larger labour markets, attracting more inward investment, leading to higher paid jobs. I think, you know, just by enabling greater business to business interaction is really important. Yeah. I think at the same time as well, the West Midlands and the Midlands as a whole, they have a number of areas which suffer from economic and social deprivation. And I think having that better connectivity will help alleviate some of those issues. Um, I know, obviously, Sarah and Toby have talked about the, the benefits that HS2 will bring. And HS2, again, we surveyed our members on this, and around 70% of, of our members have said that HS2 will bring direct economic benefits to the region. And I think it, the, uh, programs like the Midlands Rail Hub can augment some of those benefits and help bring them to life. I think more broadly as well, 
I think it's really important to take into account just some of the broader ambitions that we've got around net zero. Um, as Toby's mentioned, I think obviously getting more cars off the road, getting more journeys off the road is really important. It'll not only help obviously free up the network, but improve people's health. And, you know, one thing we always say is that a healthier workforce is a more productive one. And I think what's really important for, for an area we'll come on to talk about today is access, uh, accessing opportunities for young people. So in the pandemic, we were particularly hit uh, for opportunities for young people. So I think around the, the, during the pandemic, I think at one point, the national average for youth unemployment was around 8% across the country. In Birmingham, it was 15%. And a lot of that comes down to just not being able to access opportunities. So having the right transport networks to go to university or go to college. And I think that's a really important element to take into account for today's discussion as well. So I think there's a number of benefits that we need to, to, to really draw out of this. Um, and I think as well, businesses appreciate the pragmatic nature of this program. You know, it's, it's, it's stuff that's ready to go. It's, it's, it's strategic interventions, which all lead to immediate benefits. Um, so I think that, that they can see the, 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 the overarching principles behind the scheme and are, are supporting it. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Again, loads to pick up in, in the conversation. Um, th all three of you said in different, slightly different ways, you know, it's it's not a new scheme, which, you know, is very familiar for those of us that, you know, watch transport discussions, you know, we go round and round on, you know, what needs to be happening, whether it's HS2 or uh, Northern Powerhouse Rail or whether it's Crossrail, you know, these things have been in the ether for a very long. S Sarah, is there anything from that, you know, taking that sort of, it's been, these things are not new in, in suggestion. Is there anything that we've learned now in the case or the arguments that we're making today based on, you know, previous attempts, which I I assume have not been as successful maybe as, you know, we anticipated at the time. What, what would be your take on that? And I'll get, I'll get Toby and, and Raj. And I suppose there's, you know, there's several things in that, right? Could be that the technical arguments, maybe weren't as they were or the wider benefits arguments might not have been as strong as they are now or you know those making the argument that may not be as broad then as they are you know not, they are now in the sense of Raj saying there's a broader constituency that it's as but I mean just your just your thoughts on on that what have we learned from previous attempts to get these kinds of things done not notwithstanding the intransigence of government whoever is in government to commit to these kinds of things which I think is fairly constant right the first thing is partnership it has to be it's the partnership not just between people and organizations but it's partnership between criteria so for too long we've been saying this is a transport project this is an environmental project this is a social project now we're able to bring those things together and say look this is a project that has leveling up written all over it this is a project that commercially is beneficial because it opens up more space not just for passengers but for freight as well um you know this is this is um a social because it's getting people people out there so it ticks those different boxes i mean there are the sort of what we would call sort of traditional wider economic benefits which toby will know far more about it than i would but it is about saying look it's doing all of these things it's ticking all these different boxes and it's bringing these people together and i think to get anything over the line you need to have industry support because it's industry support that will say to the MPs, we want this. The MPs will say, yes, OK, we get behind this. So we need the political support, not just the MPs, but the local leaders, the mayors. You know, we need that sort of political uh, momentum as well. And then they will go to the Department of Transport and, says, Where, and say, Where, where's the evidence for this? So you have to have the sort of political, the industry, the evidence all working together to say, yeah, look, this is a good idea. This is what we want. And look how many of these different um boxes it ticks and we're, so it's a case of not doing things in silos and i think that's what we're doing differently this time and it's not just a badging process right it's not just saying we can talk about it in a more in a different way it's actually that the things that you're talking about expressing you know there's there's depth and meaning meaning to them it's not just you know these can do everything it'll be great don't worry about it there's actually a bit of you know there's a bit of you know there's substance to the to the arguments and to the cases that we're putting forward yeah there has to be, otherwise it would never get through the Department for Transport sort of appraisal uh, methodology. You wouldn't get, that's what I'm saying, you have to have that element of evidence. You can talk as much as you want. You can have MPs stamping their feet as much as you want, but unless you have all three of those things doing it together, you know, that's what will take it over the line. And I think that's what this does. And maybe by being 
slightly um, less political, shall we say, because we, you know, we, we don't have a, a political chair or anything like that. We, ha we can, can take that wider view. Okay, very good. So we're getting some questions coming in, which I will feed into the, the process. We've had a couple of questions on, on funding and finance. So I'm just going to park that for a minute because I'm going to come, come back to those in terms of where we are on you know, total cost, but also who's been asked for what and in what form. But let's just round this off first off. Raj, you come in in terms of this, you know, the historical element, what have we learned? Why are we better placed to make the arguments that we're doing now? Do we feel more confident that they'll have better traction in terms of success than maybe previous attempts? I mean, the business community is fundamental to that. So just just uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Well, I think context is key. And I think, obviously, if you look at the, the growth of the West Midlands economy pre-pandemic, it was on an upward trajectory. Um, and a lot of that was obviously predicated on the expected arrival of HS2. And why, you know, the, the case we made to the Okeby review was, you know, because of HS2's, you know, expected arrival, you know, there's, we've been able to put together uh, kind of economic growth plans for areas and towns and cities, which are away from the main line of route, but will benefit because they haven't had any investment for years. And I think that's something that really struck a chord with the business community. Um, they started to see firsthand, you know, here in Birmingham, you've seen, you know, the, the, the likes of HSBC opening offices up here, the likes of Goldman Sachs. They could see that just on the impending, well, I say impending, but the uh, the expected arrival of HS2 in the next few years and what that would mean for the business community. And I think what they also started to see then is actually if you invest in transport infrastructure, then that can unlock wider economic benefits, which will benefit the society as a whole. And I think really think as well, when I say context is key, you know, if we'd said, you know, five or six years ago to a majority of businesses that a lot of their staff will be working from home half the week and it'll be, you know, they'll be quite accepting of it. Um, you know, a lot of people will have a, will have a clean air zone in the centre of Birmingham. You know, that will be, that will, obviously there was some opposition to it, but by and large, it's been fairly accepting of it. I mean, there's been some teething issues, but again, businesses have obviously kind of learned to understand why it's happening, why it needs to take place. So I think that the, the Businesses are obviously more open-minded and understanding of why these things are taking place, and they're starting to see the benefits as well. Right. Um, so, you know, as I said, when we when we talk about more people working from home, um, when we talk about you know people more people commuting, not using their cars, obviously there's more restrictions in the city centre now. You know, but you know they can see that you know there are employee benefits as well from a mental health position. There are employee benefits in terms of productivity levels as well. So I think there's just a a, a sense change, really, a sense check in terms of where are the where are we going right now and i think there's a lot more open mindedness and i think the business community do actually think actually well there are some clear benefits here that we that we can um maximize if we obviously back this project Brilliant. okay toby come in on this and just round this out in terms of you know what we've learned i mean i suppose one of the things that raj was alluding to which you can see when we see this in our own analysis is that you know as the economy of the area strengthens the rationale and the benefits of enabling that those economies to continue to expand and to grow, you know, be, obviously increases as well in the sense that you know you're building on something that is increasingly doing well, and that's partly the story of you know the greater Birmingham economy over time, notwithstanding you know some of the challenges as a result of COVID and um, you know the, the recent cost of living squeeze. So in some respects, that helps and enables uh, a stronger, more than transport argument. W would you agree with that? I would. And I think, you know, what's happened since I first started looking at this sort of 15, 20 years ago, when, it, you know, it wasn't called Midlands Lao Hub. In fact, we, we were trying to avoid the name Hub at one stage to avoid confusion with what was happening in yeah. the north of England. Um, but, you know, to an extent, it's about seizing opportunities when they present themselves as well, which is often the case when you're pushing for transport investment. You know, sometimes, so, you know, the stars align sometimes on a number of different levels. And, you know, originally we were looking at how do we, you know, how do we create that additional capacity into central Birmingham for the transport network as a whole, but doing it on a purely local or at most regional basis. You know, it was all about new local services, maybe new small regional services out towards Tamworth and Dunny. But what's happened since then, and, and I think there were three things probably, one of which was persuading Network Rail that actually we needed to be looking at this more seriously. Um, and actually Network Rail come to mind and say, well, you know, there are the wider strategic benefits to the transport network here from doing this. And then the creation of Midlands Connect as a pan-regional transport body yeah. happening just at the right time 
to enable them to pick up that ball and run with it and create you know a strong business case based on those longer distance and, and interregional links which really improve connectivity not just for the region but you know actually on a national level and then thirdly hs2 coming along and actually strengthening the case even further for using Moore Street as the place to focus. On. Because, you know, if you look at Moore Street now, and you can see the works at, uh, at Curzon Street now, you know, effectively, they're going to be almost functioning as one single interchange, Moore yeah. Street and, and Curzon Street stations. I like to describe it as sort of King's Cross and Pancras in miniature, if you're familiar with London. You know, there'll be two stations facing each other across a little plaza. We're yeah. working on what we can do to improve the links there. And HS2 is brilliant in terms of connectivity, on particularly on that corridor between the West Midlands of London and the South East, and up towards the North West and Scotland. Yeah. And what Midlands Rail Hub does is actually, you know, complete the other part of those points of the compass by improve by putting the capacity in to improve that connectivity, then down to the southwest and across to Leicester, Tamworth, Nuneaton, on that e corridor going up towards, you know, the East Midlands and further north. So with the two projects combined, you know, you've actually, you know, the Midlands Rail Hub, it's not just even the Midlands Rail Hub for what Midlands Connect are proposing, what we'd like to see. I think you could include in that concept Curzon Street Station as a key part of that overall benefit. And, you know, the two things together and, and the synergy between the two things creates this amazing critical mass, which I think people still haven't quite got their head around what that's going to mean, because HS2 is already sparking a lot of development we're seeing in the east side around Digbeth, but with Midlands and our hub as well, suddenly the ease of getting into central Birmingham, connecting to other parts of the country. People are going to wake up to that if we get Midlands Rail Hub and HS2. And, and I think that transformational change really hasn't quite got into the psyche yet. Great, excellent. Okay, so we've had a couple of questions in, or several questions in. We're not going to, I'm just going to try and bring them together. We sort of a few questions on the funding uh, which come to you first, Sarah. I think it's, um, um, Roger Lawrence, who many on the call will know very, very uh, well. You know, just a question about ballpark. What's the what's the total sum of the thing, as it were? Um, so give us that. But also, I mean, again, get into a bit of a conversation about if the total sum is X, what's expected from whom and in what kind of way? So is it all central government money? Is it partly central, a bit local? And if that is, what does that mean? Is there a specific role for the business community in the way that we've seen, you know, proposals in, in other parts of the world? So Sarah, start us off with a, give us the big ballpark. How much is it going to cost? And then we'll get into where do we think that money is going to come from? If we do the full thing as we want, it'll be 1.5 billion. Right, 1.5 billion. Yeah. And over what time frame? Over a five-year time frame? It, well, as I say, it should be uh, it should be able to be delivered by 2030. So, yeah. OK, great. So that's that's our big number. Now, unpick that and say, give us a sense as to how much are we expecting from government? How much are we expecting from, you know, local, the locality, however defined? Is there a is there a demarcation, a, a sort of segmentation of of funding and funding requests? At the moment, not to my knowledge, I think that's what would happen when you get into the next stage, which is the uh, sort of final business case. And what we're sort of looking for at the moment is essentially uh, a sum of money to take it to that next stage. Right. Um, just to go, I mean, just to give you an idea, to go from the um, strategic outline business case to the outline business case is, you know, we're talking in the millions here. So it does take a lot of money just to get this evidence together because it's it's a huge sum of money. So therefore you need huge amounts of evidence to to um, to uh, prove and to say this is what's needed. I think it's fair to say there is always, um, our chairman would say that there are always people willing to invest in transport infrastructure, although it's not necessarily something we've picked up on in this country having that sort of partnerships uh, with the sort of private sector. And uh, as for local investment, Toby, how big's your checkbook? <laughs> well, and, and I think that, that that's a key issue because actually, ultimately, you know, even the bulk of the regional funding comes from national sources. Right. The, the way that the taxation structure is in this country, you know, taxation with the exception of sort of you know, local rates and things, 
is all centrally managed, which is not the case if you if you go to many countries in Europe where they have you know different regional taxes, they have specific taxes that are raised locally for funding in, in transport investment projects. Um, and we don't have that in certainly not in England. You know, there's a different situation in Scotland and Wales to an extent. So essentially and unfortunately, you know, we almost always, even for the relatively small schemes for like new stations, let, let alone something like this usually have to go cap in hand to the government, the Department for Transport and Treasury, and convince them to give us some of the uh, the money, a lot of which has come in from the good taxpayers of the West Midlands, back to invest in our own infrastructure. And I think one of the things that more widely about the devolution argument is, you know, what we all really want to do both, you know, in any of the major city regions, is actually have more control over Yes, we still have to go to get central government to get that money, but over once we've got it, how we spend it and what we spend it on and how we use that locally to lever in additional funds from elsewhere. Because at the moment, we, you know, we just don't have that freedom to do that because we, we are ultimately beholden to DFT and the Treasury. Yeah, no, very good. Raj, come in on this. I mean, you know, what, what's the sort of, what's the expectations or an appetite in the business community you know, to to think about how, you know, it can be contribute, you know, it benefits in the long run because mm-hmm. of the conditions we've talked about, but then being prepared or willing or, you know, to engage in a conversation about, you know, financing up or funding up front. I mean, we've seen that, certainly we see that in other parts of the world. We've seen a little bit of that in London in relation to the business rates taxation and the way that's dealt with uh, yeah. some of the cross rail. And, and then uh, interestingly, Patrick, uh, Wilcox is putting a company in saying, I would be prepared as a resident to pay a little bit more via council tax, which is also what we do or what's done in London in terms of uh, funding some of the things in relation to the Olympics, for example. But just give us a broad sense as to where the business community is, if and when, you know, the opportunity or the request to, to stump up some hard cash. Where do you think that where do you think your members are on that? So I, I it, it's a mixed picture because. We've had conversations in the past with Andy Street and his office around this concept of a mayoral precept. So obviously, as you mentioned, the Crossrail example there, um, there are some pr- practical considerations you have to take into account there. So, you know, you have to get, I think it's 50% of support for all the businesses involved who are keen for this to progress. And the, the point that we raised with Andy Street when he was talking about this mayoral precept uh, and his office was around thinking about the if this was going to go ahead, it'd have to be a game-changing piece of work. And it's a, it's a one-off as well. And, and that's what he was very careful about saying. He said, look, you know, if we were to invoke or utilise this, it'd have to be for a game-changing project. So we have to be very careful about how we invoke that. So I think, yes, you're right. I think that the, the appetite is there uh, to support and potentially invest where they can see that return of investment. But given the state of affairs right now, and then you know, thinking about, you know, the majority of businesses in the West Midlands, they're what? less than 10 members of staff, there's about, you know, 90% of them. You think if you're going to go down that kind of role, then it has to be, a, you know, a watertight case. And I think given the broader economic um, challenges firms are facing right now, um, that could prove to be difficult. Having said that, if there is an, a, a business case being made where, you know, it's almost using that kind of utilising that softer power. So if you can bring, you know, larger businesses on, on, on board to say, this is where we see the benefits of investing in our transport infrastructure network, lobbying central government to say look if x is delivered then we will then go ahead and increase the number of staff we've got in our offices we will then look to hire more staff locally i think that's probably going to be a the more the most practical solution moving forward i'd say okay very good sarah come back in on this in terms of you know the anticipation the expectation that as you move through the you know through the the conversation you get into the detail you know case making sort of stage that is there an expectation currently or an anticipation that non-national, let me call it that, or more local funding is going to be expected or at least, you know, raised? Have you got any indications that that is the case? I, well, I, I haven't had any indications. And to be honest, because of the regional and national importance of this, you know, there shouldn't necessarily be an expectation very, very locally. I think as a city, you know, Birmingham is benefiting. And I think that, you know, we can we can see that. I think uh, we, we've seen that just from HS2. And I think it, it's as Raj was saying, it's that, you know what, you invest in this, we'll do this. And I think it, I wouldn't want to, you know, 
maybe not more than cash, but I think the fact that businesses are getting behind it is the key to this. It is showing that unity across the region, saying that big businesses, small businesses, local authorities, politicians, this is a no brainer and uh, you know people want this to happen. And I think that um, message, that messaging saying this is what the region wants is, is pretty powerful. I mean, in fairness, that's one of the reasons Midlands Connected is in existence. We're, we're here to sort of say, look, this is the, what's right for the region rather than 22 local authorities saying different things or even saying the same thing, but quietly, we say it once all together, it has power. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, so let, let's, uh, we've had a couple of co few conversations on uh, the, or a couple of questions on sort of de delivery aspects or responsibility aspects, I suppose, as much as delivery. Um, as we move through the phase through to the, you know, if we get to the next, detailed business case kind of phase. So just give us a sense again as to who's responsible for doing what is, you know, is the is the business case and the development of it down to you? Are you holding the ring on that? And then obviously there's a broader partnership or is that in the in the hands of Network Rail or DFT? Where, where does it all sit in terms of responsibility to move that? And it's a couple of questions about, you know, if national partners or organizations are involved, how do we chivy them along so they, they make the decisions that are more relevant to the locality on that time scale rather than necessarily on on their particular time scale. So there's a lot in there, but just un and just unpack it a little bit for us if you can. Um, I'll do I'll do my best. So there's a take this closer to the rail industry yeah. the, 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 than I am. Yeah. I think to be honest, it's Network Rail that holds the in at this stage who holds the, who hold, holds the pen who um, develops the business case. We are there to. Uh, bring people together to be the facilitators to get those local authorities together to get people in the room to bring together those strategic arguments because of the, those of you know sort of DFT business cases you have a strategic case that says look how does this fit in with the wider region um, so it would be essentially network rail taking it forward but there would be any number of organizations that would have be vested interest and be heavily involved uh, this obviously DFT are in, involved. Um, you've got the the likes of the WMRE and um, Transport for West Midlands, the combined authority. All the partners across the region are involved. Uh, but essentially, it is a case of Network Rail would have the ultimate responsibility in delivering the business case. Although we all help, I think there's a proper word. There's an official name for us. I think it's something. What, Toby, do you know what it is? It's uh... like yeah. Um, I suppose. Midlands Connector, I think, the client partner is, there you is, go, that's the, the one. <laughs> is the term. And I think what 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 what's what has been fundamental, and I think a key part of the success here. Um, when we started doing this piece of work just after Midlands Connect was set up as, as a new subnational transport body, Midlands Connect were very much in the driving seat with the funding that the DFT had given them. And I think once the DFT had seen that initial high-level strategic outline business case. I think they really cottoned on to the fact that actually this is a project of national significance and they have taken since then a much greater interest and a much stronger role in overseeing the project, still with Midlands Connect as the key client partner on this. But I think that buy-in from DFT that we've had since the initial strategic outline business case through to the more recent outline business case and going forward, I, th I think really, really underlines that this, this actually is an seen by government as an important project, not just for our region, but for, for the, the UK rail network and UK economy as a whole. And I think that's encouraging. Clearly, I think we'd all like to see an early decision on re DFT releasing the next stage of funding to enable us to do the full business case. And we're pushing very strongly at the moment for that full business case to include all of the core elements of Midlands Rail Hub into more street, both cords access to the East Midlands and the South West, because there, there was some speculation, you know, a year or so ago following the publication of the integrated rail plan, where DFT came down very heavily in, in favour of one of the cords at Bordesley connecting to the South West South Wales, because that tied in very strongly with connecting to not just the West Midlands, but also HS2 for South Wales and the southwest of England. But I think since then we, we, we've, con we've combined ourselves, combined authority, Midlands Connector Network Rail to say, actually, no, you know, we can't just have one element of this. We need the whole thing 
yeah. if we're going to really make it work and maximise the benefits and actually deliver it in the most cost efficient and effective way as well. Because yeah. the minute you start splitting up a project like this, you lose all the potential economies of scale that you get, particularly if you're going into one area of Bordsley, say, digging it up, building something and then coming back five years later and doing exactly the same thing. It doesn't really make sense. So I think there's a strong push behind the scenes at the moment as well to make sure that where we do hopefully get the funding for the full business case, that that will cover all of those elements of, of Midlands Lower Hub, not just the ones that were, were previously publicly supported by the DFT in the integrated rail plan. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that raises, well, for me, it raises, and you tell me I might be missing, but I, I think that raises an interesting sort of question or, or issue really is that because of the nature of this, we've actually seen this in terms of, HS2 and particularly the you know the route up into Leeds and Sheffield right which you know when you talk to the folk of Leeds and you talk to the folk of Sheffield very important for them and for their places ultimately the decision is made by national government nationally and they go mm, not so convinced so we're going to shelve it right we're not interested in the local benefits to Leeds and Sheffield I'm not saying that's a good thought I'm just you know that paraphrasing really summarizing where I think the debate is I suppose there's a question, maybe Raji can come in on this. You know, in a sense, there are obviously local benefits from doing all of the scheme. There are national benefits of doing all of the scheme. But if the scheme is primarily driven by national agencies or interests, are, is there a danger that they, they diminish the kind of locality benefits and maximise the bits of the scheme that will give them national benefits? How do we mitigate against that? So it's very complicated kind of thing just going on in my head as as uh, Toby and Sarah were just were just talking about that. But firstly, do you see that? Are, are you alive to that? Is that a is yeah. that a potential concern? How do we marry you know the benefits of the locality so they have to do all of it rather than you know national going? Oh well, we'll just do one chord or one bit of it because that gets us enough and we don't need to do the rest. We don't need to worry about it. Raj, what's the, what what's the view on that? Yeah, well, no, I, I see where you're coming from there, and I think. You know, it's interesting, any conversation that we tend to have with government departments of Westminster, there, there always seems to be a bit of a, a binary kind of option presented when it comes to transport investment. It's either the North, as they call it, or the Midlands, and not both. And if they're talking about levelling up and they're looking at being serious about raising productivity levels for the UK as a whole, then you need to raise productivity levels across every part of the country. And I think, obviously, this is an, a, an important example of that. Um, where I think you need to strengthen the case is, like Sarah said, is having the evidence base, having the voice of local businesses, having the voice of local stakeholders, making that case in a unified fashion. And I think what was really, I'll bring you back to an example we had around the Oakerby review, um, because when we had the Oakerby review, it was very clear that stakeholders from across the West Midlands and beyond as a whole got together very quickly to make the case for HS2 and why it was so important for it, for it to be delivered in full and the benefits it would bring, not just our region, but the country as a whole. And I think because we had that joined up voice, we were able to amplify that message. And that really struck a chord with, with those people on that, on, that, um, on that committee. So I think that's, that's the key thing. And I think one thing that you know, we should mention about Midlands Connect as well, is that it's a partnership model, which includes representatives from the public sector, the private sector and others. And having that joined up voice and having that joined up thinking has been really powerful in getting us this far as it is. So I think if we can continue that going and making sure that we can keep having that kind of unison of approach, and I think that'll make a big difference. But you're right. I mean, obviously, we're looking at the, you know, the situation right now, obviously, from a fiscal point of view, they're thinking, where can we make cuts? Where can we make savings? But the longer term damage that we'll have by doing that, I think it's quite a short sighted approach to take. And if they are serious about leveling up, if they are serious about uh, bringing prosperity to all parts of the country, then, you know, they need to take on board the, the feedback they're getting from around projects like this. Okay, very good. Sarah, yeah, come in on this. And then obviously, Toby as well. But just, you know, local, national, you know, strengthening the case. You know, how do we how do we make sure that, you know, national and doesn't win out? As Raj picked up on that, our partners wouldn't let us. You know, Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire are all just as much partners as Birmingham, uh, Coventry, Herefordshire. You know, we are, have got that East-West connectivity. And East-West... Um, links have been uh, you know they've been terrible for years we know this and that's one of the reasons midlands connect came into being to try and strengthen those links and i think that is something that you know we we would focus on and i and given the sort of debate with hs2 i mean even going back three or four years when we did the strategic outline business case there was 
at all, you know, there was improvements to links to Nottingham in there. Obviously, when the IRP came out, they HS2 was going to provide those links to Nottingham. So we adjusted the rail hub to take consideration of that. But those links, what we want is, and I think what these communities want is just that commitment, the consistency, right? What is going to happen and when is it going to happen? It's the toing and froing, the well, it might happen, it might not that gets people's backs up. So it's just that commitment to say, yes, this is what's going to happen. Uh, and hopefully this is when it's going to happen. Okay, very good. That's a very good point. Toby, you wanted to come in on this on this issue as well, you know, okay. the locality benefits vis-a-vis -vis national benefits. In some respects, they're all one and the same. But if those making the decision are overwhelmingly national, then does that skew ultimately what the, you know, what the scale and scope of the scheme might be? Yes and no. <laughs> um, very good it, give us it, the yes first and then and then give us the no okay so i think clearly when you're build, building a huge piece of infrastructure like this into the middle of a, a city like birmingham a key thing to get it through you know the government hoops is that you've got to have the strongest possible business case to do that and that's something that midlands connect have been really successful in doing but in order to do that you know, midlands connect and, and, and dft have agreed that actually the focus for the business case not to say the project, but the focus for the business case is on improving that connectivity between the major centres, between the West Midlands and Birmingham and Bristol and Cardiff and Leicester. You know, it, it, it's those big picture ones where, and, and, and to an extent, Worcester and Hereford. You know, and that's what the, the business case that's been presented to government is based. And actually, it's the right thing to do. It gives you almost, you know, the biggest bang for your buck when you when you when when you're crunching the numbers, uh, where there's generally improvements to sort of the local rail services often local rail services are still you know relatively well subsidized by government in any case um, don't necessarily help the, the overall case but I mean what's been crucial with this is certainly we Midlands Connect and in particular Network Rail really see the wider strategic business the strategic benefits to the rail network as a whole over and above what's purely in the Midlands Connect business case. And we've been making those strategic arguments with DFT to support the business case that's got in. And also, I mean, speaking from, from a, a local level now with, a, with a, a Transport for West Midlands hat on, we know that without the additional infrastructure of Midlands Rail Hub, you know, we are almost never gonna be able to deliver some of our more local aspirations and, and some of those that are on the, the mayor's you know aspiration aspirational plan for 2040 you know something like new services on on the line from birmingham out through fort parkway castle bromwich and then round onto the sutton park line picking up minworths warmly's streetly's of this world there's no capacity that to run a service like that at the moment what Midlands Rail Hub does in terms of that, although it's not part of the business case, is it does give you that capacity to think, yes, you know, we could potentially look to introduce these services in future because we can now get them into Birmingham, which we can't at the moment. They still have to have their own separate business case, you know, their, their own strategic rationale for doing it. But without Midlands Rail Hub, you know, some of these, these wider local aspirations are just undeliverable. And that's why it's important. So it's all about, yes, we focus on, 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 on the core Midlands Connect narrative and business case, but support that with all of the local ends. So well, actually, yeah, this underpins everything else we do and we yes, can't do it. Cascading consequences of, of an initial decision or not, as it were, as you know, as to what, what is then enabled or not enabled, you know, as we move into the um, you know, into the future on on different sort of schemes. I think that's a very a good point. I, I, I know that all three of you are not um politicians. Maybe start with you, Raj, as a business as a business perspective. But the, what's the kind of politics of the of the proposition? As as in, you know, is there at the local level, you know, is there broad agreement, broad engagement from you know political interests on different sides of the of the equation in terms of what this scheme is and what you know the virtues of it. You know, you you, you come at it from a business point of view, obviously, but you're engaging with political uh, fork of different stripes. What's your sense as to where the political consensus is on this? Or is there a little bit of political contention depending on what colour they are? Yeah, I'd say it's a mix really. So um, so I know before Christmas, we we had 
uh, a meeting with Tan Desi, the Shadow Rail Minister, and he was up in Birmingham and uh, he met with a number of councillors, a number of business representatives, ourselves and others. And yeah, he was very receptive to the benefits that the Midlands Rail Hub could bring. I mean, what I would say that in the time that I've been here, it's quite interesting to obviously talk to uh, politicians of, of different uh, political parties across the different parts of the region. And sometimes there is a lack of awareness of you know, the, the benefits that some of these projects can bring. Now, whether that's just because they're, they're seeing these projects through the, the you know, the, the prism of their own constituency and what that'll mean for them. So, I mean, one of the challenges that we've had over the years is trying to explain to, you know, um, MPs for the different parts of the region that, you know, HS2 is not just a fast train from London to Birmingham. It's the wider socioeconomic benefits it will bring and unlock that will help the region as a whole. And I think, I think that's started to change in the last couple of years. I really do. I think there has been more of an understanding of the need for greater transport infrastructure investment in the region and the broader benefits it can bring. But yes, I think to an extent, and I think you'll see it more as well as we get closer to 2024 and expected election, where um, where there might be some toing and froing around what this actually means. Is this money actually worth it? Where where can we have make it more hyper local? Um, yes, I think there are some of those issues still, and I think there's still a piece of work that needs to be done around educating not just MPs, but the broader public as well, just really getting that message out there about why, you know, th th these types of projects are really important for them and how they'll impact their day-to-day -day life. And do you, do you think in the sense that, not leave the politics for a second, I'll come back to that and get Sarah and Toby's view on that, but on, just on your final point about the public, the, the lack of engagement is because what they see, this isn't for them, you know, it's it's a scheme that they won't, they won't use or they won't benefit from. What's your, you know, what's it's disruption, but not, you know, I don't see any of the rewards. What's your sense yeah. as to the, what's holding that back? I think it's 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 the it's the definition of the narrative, really, and I think that's that. It, just it's no, you know, it's not a criticism of everyone, anyone involved. It's just no. very difficult to get people interested in, you know, a, a kind of a broader project which they might not see on their doorstep. But actually, if that funding is made available, then that will help them, you know, access opportunities. It will help create new job roles. It might help someone in their family, you know, make it easier to get to college or university by using public transport. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. Some of the work we're doing right now with the Department of Education is on the local skills improvement plans and looking at the post-16, you know, technical education landscape. One of the things that comes up quite frequently is, you know, there might be someone who's working in logistics and there might be a course they want one of their staff to go to. But they said, look, we're based in Birmingham. The, 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 the course is on in Coventry. It's going to take, you know, ages to get there. And it's not, you know, how are we supposed to get our, you know, our staff out there? And I think when you start to have those kind of discussions around the practical issues that firms are facing and how projects like this might help alleviate some of those issues, that's when it starts to come to life a bit more. And that's where they start to get a bit more buy-in. I think that's something that we've tried to do as partners across the board. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. You're trying to make it real and practical so people can and A, understand it, but also then B, engage with it and be able to you know be supportive of it as, as appropriate. Sarah, come back to this, the politics of it. You know, I'm not asking you to make judgments on all of that kind of stuff. Coventry is fine. The, you know, is there a broad consensus? Raj alluded to the fact that, you know, in the not too distant future, we will go to a, you know, into a general election and, you know, different parties will be setting up their stalls in different ways. Does that help hinder, you know, where are we on the political front? I'd like to say we transcend it, but we're not <laughs> oblivious to it. <laughs> um, Raj is right. We had this session with uh, the, the Shadow Rail Minister came up um, in, in December. He had a round table. He spent the whole morning, actually, up in Birmingham looking at just at the rail hub. Um, he did some, you know, it was almost fact finding for him because he knows that in a, a year or two time, he's thinking about that manifesto. He's thinking about what's going to go into it. So he wanted to be fully aware. Nobody sort of forced his hand. Yeah. He was there to find out how this was going to benefit the region. And this, as I said, this is something that we, we've been doing because we have different political parties across the whole Midlands. You know, this is what we do is say, look, we have to get, get over that and say, this is why this works for the region. Yeah. And trust me, it's pretty tricky trying to tell Lincolnshire why they should get excited about something that's going on in Worcester or, you know, Telford and Reakin about, you know, Telford, you'd really need to be excited about this project in Nottingham, whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. It is talking about that sort of benefit. And it is that old cliche and about, you know, um, you know, you may not get the concrete poured, but you should get some of the benefits. And it's that connections and linkages across the region that gives those benefits. Yeah, very good. Toby, come in on this. It's just, a, the, you know, the politics of the here and the now, but cast your eye to, you know, to... 
in the not too distant future general election period? And you know, does that create an opportunity or are we just going to be in a sort of paralysis or pause moment where we'll have to wait for all that to clear before we can make progress? I mean, what's your sense as to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think elections do create opportunities for, for politicians to make promises. And, and clearly you, you have to be able to capitalise on that. Um, I, I think with Midlands Lower in particular, I think the fact that there is a strong local consensus amongst the core politicians across the West Midlands region, that this is the right thing to do, both in, in the East Midlands and the West Midlands. You know, that includes, you know, Andy Street, it includes Birmingham City Council, and it includes the shires and, and unitaries. So I, th I think we're in a strong place. I think from, from my point of view, I think the only place where I, I do feel it would be good to get some additional political support with, with a small P um, would be from the South West and the South Wales, the Bristles and Cards who <laughs> will benefit from this. You know, undoubtedly, they will have improved connectivity, not just to, to the West Midlands, but to the rest of the country with Midlands Rail Hub. Um, I know, you know, we've spoken to them, Midlands Connect have spoken to them uh, in terms of the West of uh, England Combined Authority and also Transport for Wales. I think they get it. But I suppose that they've probably got their own, I suppose, more local and more parochial issues that are occupying more of their time, whether it's a, you know, a, a commuter network that needs to be created for the greater Bristol area with new lines out of Portishead, or whether it's, you know, transforming the valley lines into Cardiff and, and electrifying the main line to Swansea. I think they, they've probably got other other areas which are clearly you know, more important for them. And so, so perhaps it's understandable, but uh, it would, would be nice to see just a little bit more support from beyond the, the West Midlands and the East Midlands region. And we, we get that kind of network rail. Network rail see that bigger picture, what it does for the national rail network. But be good to be good to try and bring on those the southwest and south wales on board as well a little bit more to make that argument with us brilliant okay we've got a couple of minutes left so a quick whiz round raj just very practically and, and very immediately i suppose you know what what need from from the business community what needs to happen next we've got this momentum we you know we're making progress literally what's the next thing that you know, from a business perspective needs to happen. And I'll come to get Toby's view and, and we'll finish with Sarah on that as well. So Raj, just give us that view. What needs to happen next? What do you need to see happen? Well, we would love to see in the spring budget that the government commits to this and is going to move ahead with uh, the, the progress on the on the, um, on the the project. So I think, yeah, it's having that confirmation of go from government that they are committed and they are moving forward because that then will give businesses the confidence to even kind of further back this project and start thinking about the benefits that they could accrue from the delivery of this project and how they can, like I said, look at exploring new markets domestically, look at expanding their premises if they're going to hire new people, thinking about where they might need to hire people as well. So I think it's just having that, that, that backing from central government is going to be absolutely crucial to keep that momentum up. Great. Excellent. Okay. Toby, similar question. I suppose, you know, very practically, very immediately, you know what? What needs? To, what's the next thing that needs to happen to keep the momentum up? Well, speak, speaking, I mean, the, 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 there's clearly some lobbying going on and has been behind the scenes. There's a very good Midlands Connect event just before Christmas in the Council House in Birmingham Indeed. that was well attended by by all the you know the key the key people involved in this to to you know press the case with government. Um, I mean, in terms of I suppose technically, we're we're in what the department call their rail network enhancements process. Um, so we're waiting technically for a decision to design from the Secretary of State to enable us to proceed to that full business case and design phase of the project. And it is, it is a, you know, a, a fixed and recognised process that the DFT follow. But clearly we need that decision to be made and, and we need the funding that goes with it to enable us to proceed to that design and full business case phase. And hopefully we need it sooner rather than later. Brilliant. OK, Sarah, I saw you nod into, you know, Toby, but you saw just anything to add in terms of the immediacy and the, you know, the practical next thing. Those, yeah, those are the practical things. We, we need that decision. We need to move forward with the whole of the, con the, the, the plan as well, not just part of it. I think that's key because we need that commitment, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I think it would be very easy looking at the sort of problems that there are at the moment in terms of, you know, yeah, what's it, financial constraints 
and things like that for people to sort of go into themselves and sort of say no no not going to do anything good. but we can't yeah. let that happen yeah. You know, we need to get that bounce back after COVID. We need to keep that investment because we need to keep looking long term, because if we don't, then HS2 isn't going to do as well as we want it to. Local, the local economy won't do as well as we want it to. The regional economy won't do in order to make the Midlands work. And even, you know, even the, the north as well. I mean, we, you, you talk about that division between, the you know, invest, we must invest in the north. But, yeah, we've got to be able to get there as well. Yeah. So we need to keep that strategic eye open we can't just sort of focus on the immediate things we need to make sure that we have that commitment and consistency going forward to get not only the network the midlands deserve but the opportunities the people deserve as well because again as i start, i think i started by saying that's why we do this Excellent. to allow people and business to grow that uh, is a very good region. point to finish on it's one o'clock so we definitely need to uh, to finish. Big thanks to my panel, Sarah, Toby and Raj. Thank you very much for being with us today, the three of you. It's been really, really helpful. Thanks to Midlands Connect for supporting and working with us on the event. Much appreciated. Thanks to all of you for joining. We had lots of great questions. Uh, I, I think we kind of got through some of them, or at least the, the, the gist of, of many of them. So thank you very much uh, for that. We wish the next stage well. We'll be keeping an eye on and helping where we can. But until the next time, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much indeed. Bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.